Well, hi, everybody, and happy Earth Day. My name is David Ringer, and I want to welcome you to Episode 3 of I Saw a Bird, Audubon's Spring Migration Show. I saw a bird today. It was a white-throated sparrow in the tree outside my window here in New York City, and I was singing their beautiful whistled song, um, which was a really nice treat. Hello, everybody. I am Christine Lynn from Audubon, and today I was looking outside earlier and I saw a flash of red against a green tree, and sure enough, it was a northern cardinal. So that was the bird I saw today. Well, and we have a special surprise for you tonight, Christine. Last week, you said that one of the birds you wanted to see is an indigo bunting, and yeah. so we've got something to share with you. Um, this photo that'll be coming up in a minute is uh, indigo bunting that my mom took today in her yard in Missouri. Uh -huh. um, and the slide we actually have up right now is a black-throated blue warbler, but we'll pull up that indigo bunting in just a moment. There we go. Oh, that's uh, such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bird. Uh, so from my mom to you, Christine, happy spring migration. And uh, <laughs> Thank you. As you as you can see there, there's an empty dandelion seed head next to the bird. And my mom said, well, I don't mind the dandelions so much because I see how much the indigo buntings and the gold finches love them. Your mom is so, such a good thanks. photographer. She is. She does a really great job. So thanks, mom. And Christine, we hope you enjoy. And we hope you get to see a real one soon. So with that, uh, we're excited to get started with our uh, show. It's a very special show today because today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, so we've got a great lineup of guests today. We'll be talking about what Earth Day means to us. We'll be talking about bird migration, of course. Uh, and we'll be talking about climate change. And we'll be talking about what gives us hope. Um, so in the chat, in the comments, Please share birds that you saw today. Please give things that give, share things that give you hope here on Earth Day. Um, and we want to know from you what some of those things are. We'll read them on air during the show. So with that, let's bring in our first pair of guests. Uh, Christine and I are lucky enough to call these folks our colleagues and friends. Dr. Brooke Bateman is our Senior Scientist for Climate at the National Audubon Society. And Dr. Jill Depe is our Senior Director for the Audubon Migratory Bird Initiative. Um, so let's get started with a, a good fun question here for both of you. Last week, I shared some of my favorite bird migration stories. And now I wanna ask you, Jill, to get started and share what might be one of your favorite bird migration stories. Yeah, that's it. Um... I have to say that's a tough question. <laughs> I could probably go on. Um, I would say probably my most my most memorable um, bird story is from when I was a graduate student. So it was a long time ago, but it stuck with me. Um, so I had been doing my graduate studies on migratory birds along the northern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. I was I was studying birds during fall migration to understand what habitats they needed, what resources they were eating. And one night, and I was living in this small fishing town while I was doing my work. And one night we were hanging out in the town square and all of a sudden we started hearing some chirps. We look up and there are birds flying and they were coming in from the Gulf. And so we looked up and we could see them we could, because the lights were illuminating their, their breasts. And we heard more chirps and more and more and more and more birds. And we could look up and we could see them. And there were big ones and small ones, but they were just flying at different heights. And they just kept coming. So we laid down on the park benches, draw a lot, draw a lot of attention to ourselves. But we just laid there for, I don't know, at least a couple hours. It was like 10 at night. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, where had these birds come from? How far had they traveled? How many made it? And so I've spent the rest of my career, you know, at that point, I decided that I needed to know the answers and dedicated my entire career to studying migratory birds. And now I'm at the Audubon Society. We are, um, I work with a fantastic team of scientists at the, um, as part of the Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative. And I should say, you know, even outside of Audubon, we've got lots of partners and we're working together to synthesize all of the information that's being collected out there and pulling it together so we can understand where the most important places are for migratory birds um, and what the threats are. And then from there, figure out the solutions so that we can protect them. 
and we often think when conservationists, scientists talk about conservation, we often think about, you know, land acquisition and restoration, but it's not all about that. And there's a lot that we can do. Um, those of you who are on the phone, I'm going to pull up an image here if I can share my screen here. Um, because I really want to want to show you an example of what you can do. And this here is a black throated blue warbler. Um, and, you know, we we think about land acquisition or some of these typical conservation actions that we have, but we can't protect everywhere that birds need. And what we can all do is do a little bit to help these birds along. And so one of the programs at Audubon, and I, I love this program, um, I checked it out before I even joined Audubon, it's called Plants for Birds. And you know, one of the ways we can help birds during migration, but also in breeding um, in the US, winter in other countries, is to plant native plants. They provide fruit. Um, lots of birds during fall migration eat fruit, so um, great time for you to be putting in plants like this one here, um, the beauty berry, the American beauty berry, to see birds in your backyard and to provide them resources. Um, there's also bird safe buildings trying to reduce collisions and we can all do these activities right now. Um, and it's a great thing to start doing while we're all at home, thinking about how we can improve our houses and our yards. Um, and we can do a lot and it all adds up to have a tremendous impact on birds. That's a great point. And it's a really great follow up to what our theme was last week on our show, which was plants for birds. Um, and yeah, I think looking at the sky is one of the most relaxing things at night. So that's a wonderful story. So Jill, I have another question for you. At Audubon, we often talk about this thing called flyways, which is basically <laughs> the highways that birds travel through um, when they're migrating. So with all of these birds traveling to so many different places, how do you keep track of all these different pathways? That's a great question. Um, you know, when we, we think about flyways, we often think of these maps with these really large arrows, you know, that cross the hemisphere telling us where, you know, large numbers of birds go. And it's, it's not that easy. These are um, very generalized. And to be able to make conservation decisions and know where we should be, you know, focusing our efforts, it's, um, you know, it's, it's complicated, it's nuanced, but, you know, I'm happy to say that we're actually in this golden age of migration science. So we have lots of new technology that we can use to track individual birds as far as, you know, Canada to Colombia. And I'm going to show you, this is an example of one of the, these birds. And I think, David, you might have mentioned this in an earlier episode. This is the black pole warbler. This is a small songbird. Um, it doesn't weigh very much, but um, they make spectacular journeys all the way from, you know, Alaska and northern Canada, that those green areas where they breed. Each of these small yellow dots that's zipping across the page, these are black pole warblers. These are individual birds that have been tracked by scientists. And what you notice is that, you know, they spend a lot of time on their wintering grounds. They actually spend more time away from us than with us. So they can spend up to eight months a year away from us during migration and winter. Um, the other thing that's really cool and is if you track these dots for a while, they make some pretty impressive flights. And what researchers have learned from using this new tracking technology is that they can fly across the Atlantic Ocean for three days straight. No stopping, no resting. You, you know, and I, I can't get my head around this because if I travel just across the state of Maryland, I probably am stopping at least once for gas and something to eat. And, and so trying to get my head around this is incredible. Um, you know, and I should note that those black points um, that are those stipple patterns in the back, those are eber observations. So we have tons of people on this call, hundreds on this call, and many not, who go out, they look at birds, and they report their observations to eBird. And those points are what you see here. So if you're doing eBird records, please keep doing it. It's a tremendous value for scientists and conservationists. Um, but, you know, it's something to, you know, I really always um, like to point out is that Audubon did not collect these data. 
these are the data that come from researchers, individual grad students, professors who are out there, you know, doing all the heavy lifting, um, catching these birds. So we've been very grateful to have these kinds of data. And so we appreciate them. And, you know, this is really a community effort um, to pull these data together. And of course, we have eBird in there and all of our partners. This is much broader than, than Audubon. So there's room for all of us. Thanks, Jill. I just love this story. And yeah, I did talk about it last week. And in fact, I went on to read a fact that I wanted to share with everybody. So the Black, the Black Pole Warbler weighs about as much as a pencil. And as you said, they travel three days without stopping across the Atlantic Ocean. And so the fact that I read is if you correlate distance traveled nonstop with body weight, this would be a human of about my size traveling 20% of the way from Earth to Venus without stopping under your own power, uh, which just completely blew my mind, even more than it was already blown by these amazing birds. Yep. Amazing. I did not know that. I can't even run like yeah. 10 minutes without stopping, so this is even more impressive to me. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing. Uh, so, Brooke, uh, let's bring you in. And, you know, your specialty is around climate change and how that affects organisms. But we'd love to have you talk about a question that we got from a lot of our viewers last week, which is, does climate change affect bird migration? And if so, how? Yeah, that is a great question. And yes, the answer is yes. So a lot of what we see with birds migrating is related to climate. So changes in seasons is what cues birds to migrate. Birds in North America tend to fly south when it um, starts to get colder. And so they're cued by temperatures and changes in the sun. And so we see birds changing their patterns because of recent climate change. And across the board, what we're seeing is birds are arriving earlier in spring in particular because we're having earlier springs and our winters are warming. So across the board, we're, we're seeing um, species that uh, have decided in some cases not to leave at all. So we're, we're seeing species that are overwintering in areas because they become so warm. Um, so they're not migrating. They're not, they're not finding those cues that they used to have to, to migrate. So are there any particular bird species you know of that are already seeing these behavioral changes due to climate change? Yeah, so I think um, one example that was already brought up is the black-throated blue warbler. So this species is actually migrating one day earlier per decade. Uh, and this is, we're seeing this across many species. So Townsend's warblers and yellow-billed cuckoos are another example. And one of the issues that you have is if migration is changing, if, if species are arriving in their breeding grounds at different times, they might not be arriving at the same time that their resources are available. And so we're having this mismatch, particularly with those last two species I mentioned, the Townsend's warbler and the yellow-billed cuckoo, where when they arrive on their breeding grounds, they're actually not hitting it at the same time as the peak resources for their young. And so the reason for this is that because winters are warming earlier, vegetation is um, having the, the leaves are growing earlier and then the insects are available earlier. And so when the birds arrive at the breeding ground, they're not finding the resources they need, particularly insects and berries and seeds and stuff that they need for breeding. And so 96% of land birds are feeding insects to their young. If they don't arrive and at the same time when there's resources are available, then it's gonna be really problematic. Um, that's another reason why Plants for Birds and planting native plants is really important because you can really help um, native plants support more insects. Um, so I think it's just a really great opportunity to help support migratory birds. But I also want to highlight, and if I can share my screen now as well, I will. Let's see. That it's more than just the timing that changes, it's also the location that changes. And so as the climate changes on the landscape, certain areas are becoming warmer. Um, and so birds like this adorable brown-headed nuthatch are, are finding it a little bit difficult to um, live in the areas that they occur in. So this species isn't a migratory species in the sense of some of the ones that we've been talking about. But what we're finding is that they're responding to climate change already. Um, in October, we put out a report called Survival by Degrees, where we were looking at how climate change is affecting birds within their ranges. Um, and this is just an example here of the brown-headed nuthatch where we can really see um, what's gonna happen with the species with climate change. So here we're looking at different climate change scenarios from one and a half degrees 
um, from current to one and a half degrees Celsius to two to three degrees Celsius. And three degrees is the, the, the trajectory we're on if we don't take any actions to curb global warming. Uh, and so with, for the brown-headed nuthatch, you can see as we get to those warmer scenarios, they're actually losing large amounts of their range. Um, so these areas are, are in red that you can see here. Um, and one of the things we're doing at Audubon is we have a program called Climate Watch, where we're actually tracking on the ground how these birds are responding to climate change. And what we're finding with species like the brown-headed nuthatch is that they actually are. And so this species is shifting northwest based on the, the data that our volunteers, just like Jill mentioned, people that are out there collecting data in eBird, um, uh, community scientists that go out there and collect data for us for our Climate Watch program have found that these birds are shifting as climate change is um, uh, showing that they will with these models. And so that, that's something to think about too. We have these phenology changes in terms of species are migrating at different times and then they have the added pressure of where they live is actually changing as well. Cool, that's a really great model. and It's a really great way to visualize all the different scenarios that would happen. So thank you for sharing that. So I have another question on Audubon social. We often use the hashtag birds tell us in the context that birds tell us that the time to act on climate is now. So my question is why are birds such great indicators for how the planet is doing? Yeah, so, so birds are fantastic indicators. And, and part of the reason is because they're so intimately tied with our environment that if something slightly changes with the environment, they're connected to that. And so they respond right away. The other thing that's really important about birds is, is because they're so ubiquitous, they're, they're just so easy to see and it's such an accessible part of nature that you notice when things change. Uh, for an example, um, my father is a birder and he's been feeding his birds for 40 years at his feeder. And several years ago, he came up to me and he said, I have this new feeder bird. And um, he, he was very excited about it. And he said, it's a Carolina wren. Uh, and this is a species that actually uh, in science and scientific studies, we've shown that it's expanded its range northward as winters have become more mild and warmer. And so this species is able to move into areas that it, it didn't before. And so we have the science telling us that, but then we also have a backyard birder that's able to see that with their own eyes. And I think that that's what's so important about birds. If you go back to the silent spring era when we were having issues with pesticides and DDT, we looked to the birds and that's how we found out there was something going on. And that really helped spur the uh, environmental movement that brought on Earth Day. And so I think that because they're so accessible and they're so well loved, it, it's just a really, um, they really connect us to nature and particularly with climate change, this is a global aspect, it's a global concept, but they help us see how things um, are happening in a local scale. So I think um, because they are so tied and because we see them, they really, really help us understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So because we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, a question to both you and Jill is what does Earth Day mean to you? Jill, do you want to go first? <laughs> can go first. <laughs> I can go first. Um, well, uh, for me, you know, Earth Day is a commitment. It's a daily commitment. It's um, a commitment to protecting Earth and fully appreciating that we depend on it 100% for everything we need. And it's, you know, it really is our obligation to make sure we protect it. And it's not just for the birds, it's, it's for us, right? And what's good for birds is good for us. Um, and as a parent, I am constantly thinking about this, wanting to make sure like so many of us there that the next generation has, you know, something, you know, to, to appreciate the beauty, but also, you know, the resources they need. Um, you know, it's, it's food, it's clean air and clean water. And what I always, uh, what I want to encourage everyone to think about is that we need to think about all humans. And, you know, I'm, my family, we're privileged. We live near green spaces. We have clean air. We have clean water. We live in a great place. Um, but what I think we need to be doing is thinking about protecting the environment for everybody beyond just our families and our friends and our local neighborhood. Very well said, Jill. Um, I think for me, I was thinking, I was thinking about Earth Day this morning. I take my cup of coffee and I go outside and I, I listen to the birds around me. We've got some some visitors. Sorry, work from home. <laughs> Dangerous. Hi, new friends. 
Yeah, so every morning, especially since we've been sort of stay at home, I, I go outside and I, I, I listen to the birds around me. It really helps me find my sense of place. Um, and I was thinking about Earth Day and, and I was actually really struck about how I remember so clearly being in element, elementary school and having Earth Day at school and learning about like recycle, reduce, reuse, recycle, what we can reserve water, like what can we do to, to save the earth? And like that really stuck with me and spurred the career that I'm on now. I'm a conservationist because when I was young, I was taught about Earth Day. I was taught about what we need to do to protect our earth. Um, and I also have a, a five-year-old and she drew me this picture this morning with a, a beautiful picture of the earth with rainbows and protect the earth on it. And um, she's, she's sort of my inspiration for this. Like I, I see myself and her when I was her age learning about Earth Day. And now I want to pass that legacy on to her and others. So I think it's so important for us to continue to talk about Earth Day on Earth Day, but also every day. Um, and I, I echo what Jill said, we need to do this beyond just for us. We have to do this for, for all communities. That's so well put. Do you have the picture there where you can hold it up for us or is it in another room? Looking yeah, at show us. Reason. So she's, she's five. Oh, yeah. I love it. It's That's great. great. Terrific. Uh, well, we have another question from Jacqueline, who wants to know how birds withstand the force of wind, which can be so strong when the birds are so lightweight. Which one of you wants to take that question? I guess I could take it. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, how do migratory birds um, withstand the wind? Well, when it gets really windy, birds will hunker down. They, they won't fly because they really do get pushed around by the wind. Um, but wind isn't necessarily a bad thing either. So for example, in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic, birds actually wait for, for winds that will help push them across. Again, they can't be too strong, but it, they actually need those winds. And when they have great winds, they, the winds just help push them along, you know, the Gulf, the Atlantic, that's how those black holes can also make it three days across the Gulf. So wind is good, but it has to come from the right direction, not be too strong, just right. Um, but they are, miraculous and I will say one thing um, for my research um, with my collaborators in the Gulf of Mexico we had a bird a Swainson's thrush that had left the northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico just as Hurricane Sandy was moving up the eastern part of the U.S. and the bird flew across the Gulf in 13 hours. It had just the right winds that it sort of slingshotted across to to the peninsula. So wind is um, definitely needed and it will be interesting under climate change to see how those wind conditions can, can impact the birds. Yeah, great question. Amazing, great. thank you. So we have a question from someone named Jillian and this one is for Brooke. Do birds show stress from adapting to climate change? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that we're starting to see birds respond to climate change in different ways. Um, one I mentioned, I mentioned two species are changing where they live and they're also changing their migration periods, but we're also seeing other changes. We're seeing changes in egg date, egg laying dates. So some species are laying their eggs earlier to sort of compensate for those changes in temperatures because eggs need to have a specific temperature for them to, to be able to hatch and incubate properly. So we are seeing some stressful events, particularly during extreme weather events in terms of breeding um, when it comes to that. Um, we're also seeing some really extreme weather events in the northern parts of the US, particularly Alaska, with extreme heat that is happening in the oceans. And the past couple of years, we've had been seeing extreme seabird die-offs, which is, is really, really upsetting to see thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds washing up on shore due to starvation. And that's because there's been whole changes and cascades in the ecosystem um, with the fisheries that a lot of these seabirds are eating. Um, so I think that we're seeing clear signs that birds are stressed from climate change. Uh, another really fascinating thing is that we've seen that birds have actually uh, changed their body size. They've become smaller and their wings have become longer. Um, this is across the board across multiple species. And so that's because as temperatures warm, birds have to sort of compensate for this extra heat and to be able to, uh, to fly further distances. So we're definitely seeing some stress on birds. Um, some species are, are disappearing from whole parts of their range. Um, so climate change is not just a future far off event. It's, it's already affecting birds now.
Thank you for that. Um, and so we've got another question. Please keep your questions coming uh, in the chat. Also continue sharing things that give you hope or birds you saw today. Uh, but this question is for you, Jill, from Sophia. And Sophia wants to know, how do birds survive not stopping for resources during migration? So we've talked about flying three days nonstop, for example. How do they do that? Yeah, uh, that's, <laughs> you know, this great question that so many people have been, been thinking about. One way um, is that they actually eat a lot <laughs> or they migrate. They have to get, they have to actually, you know, get pretty fat and not too fat, right? Because if they're too fat, they can't escape predators and it takes a lot of energy, um, but they get pretty fat. Um, and what that means is to be able to migrate, especially, you know, birds that are flying nonstop around these coastal areas or even inland a bit, they need really good habitat so they can feed, um, they can rest ahead of the flight um, and they can replenish their energy. Again, you know, those critical habitats before and also after crossing the Gulf are, are key to making that happen. So if you leave with good winds and you have enough fat, you're probably good to go. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, it all depends on having, you know, those resources available. And that's, again, where, where we can all help these birds. Yeah. And some of them go through pretty wild swings in their total body mass during migration, right? We're not talking about a little bit around the edges. No, we're not talking about that. There are, um, you know, some can double their mass before migration, you know, wow. and um, they are, you know, you blow apart their feathers and it's just this big layer of extra patty, extra energy. <laughs> so they burn it off. Um, yeah, and they can burn through it and actually spend some time, you know, using, you know, in some cases have to use up their muscles. So when they make their next stop, they have to, you know, um, those organs start to get smaller and they have to, you know, bring their organs back to condition, sometimes replenish that muscle. So it's pretty, it's pretty stressful. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, so, Brooke, we've got another one from you. This is from Andre. And while you answer, I'm going to pull up a picture of an example bird for this question. But um, so Andre says there's lots of discussion here on the effects of climate change on neotropical migrants. Is there any science on how climate change will impact altitudinal migrants? And maybe you could also define both of those terms for us. And while we do that, I'm going to pull up a picture of a pinion jay from the Audubon Field Guide online. Of course. So neotropical migrants are some of our species that we see here in summer. They, they come here to breed, but in winter they fly south, generally to South America, so much further south than we don't see them at all in the winter as opposed to some of our short distance migrants. Uh, An altitudinal gradient is actually a species that will shift instead of um, going by like up and down north south it'll go up and down the mountain and so they might spend part of their uh, season at the bottom of the mountain and then they would shift up slope to, to kind of uh, compensate for these changes in temperatures in different years we definitely are seeing changes with our altitudinal migrants um, we are seeing in uh, pretty much across the world species that live on mountains are really at risk to climate change because the issue is, is that they, can, they only have so far that they can shift up a mountain. And so once they get to the top of the mountain, um, trying to kind of escape heat because it gets cooler as you get to the top of the mountain, they have nowhere else to go. They can't just like go off the top of the mountain and find a um, habitat nearby. It's a little bit more tricky for them to find other mountains that they might be able to go to. So this is a problematic, it's also um, something that we really need to be concerned about also because vegetation takes longer to shift um, up and down mountains as well. So it's just another way of compensating for climate change, uh, but they, they are going to run out of space pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. wow. All right, so that concludes this segment. Thank you so much, Jill and Brooke, for joining us on this conversation. And to the audience, keep the questions coming. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye. Happy Earth Day. Thanks so much. Happy Earth Day. Well, we're incredibly honored to have a very special guest here tonight. Her name is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, and uh, Dr. Hayhoe is an accomplished atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where we live. She's also a phenomenal communicator. Um, she's a professor at Texas Tech University, and she hosts the PBS digital series Global Weirding, which is a great title. 
Um, Dr. Hayhoe has been named Times, one of Times 100 Most Influential People, one of Fortune's 50 World's Greatest Leaders. Uh, she's been awarded the Geophysical Union's Climate Change Communication Prize, along with other well-deserved honors. She gave the plenary lecture at the Audubon 2015 convention as well. So, uh, Dr. Hayo, you have a history with Audubon, and we're just delighted to have you on tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here with you. And I was listening to a little bit of the very interesting discussion before I joined. Good. We're, we're glad. So uh, let's get started with this question. You often say that it's important for people to talk about climate change and what we can do to fix it. And you emphasize that talk about part. What is your thinking behind that? Yes. So often people say, well, what's the most important thing I could do? And we typically think of light bulbs, recycling, um, eating more plant-based food, uh, maybe getting solar panels or buying a used electric car. But when you crunch the numbers, it turns out that two thirds of all of our heat trapping gas emissions since the dawn of the industrial era were produced by 90 companies. And those 90 companies include the richest in the world. And they include British Petroleum who uh, back 15 years ago invested a huge amount of money in a PR scheme to make all of us individuals conscious of our carbon footprint and the need to reduce it. Why? because if we're focusing on our carbon footprint, we're not focusing on theirs. So talking about it is really important. And I'm gonna share my screen with you because there is a series of really fascinating maps that I want you to see. Okay, here we go. Just a second here. Um, this is from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. They ask people across the whole country, they actually have these maps for Canada as well, but I'm just gonna show you the US ones. They ask people, do you think, for example, that global warming is happening? Anywhere that's orange is more than 50% of people say yes. And the darker orange it is, the more people say yes. If it's blue, that means less than 50%. So it turns out that just about everybody says, yes, it's happening. And then you say, will it harm plants and animals? Absolutely, yes. It's orange across the whole country. Will it harm future generations? Yeah, it's still orange across the country. But then you say, will it harm us in the United States? We start to see some wow. blue in there, yeah. And then here's the kicker. They say, "Will do you think it will harm you personally? Oh, wow. Look at that, it is blue. So the biggest problem we have is not that people don't think it's real, it's that they don't think it matters to us. And then there's one more map that's darker blue. And the darker blue map is this one. Do you ever talk about it? Look at that. Wow. wow. There's only a couple of counties. I think Seattle and San Francisco are the only counties where more than 50% of people and barely more even talk about it. So here's the connection. If we don't talk about something, why would we think it matters? And if we don't think it matters, why would we ever want to fix it? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you for that. So if people are hearing you tonight or watching us later online and they say, that makes sense to me, I wanna be a part of the solution, how do you tell people to just get started? This can be intimidating, right? How should they talk about climate change? It absolutely can be scary. And I wanna assure you, you don't wanna talk about it by hauling out all the science and hitting people upside the head with it. You might be saying, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not the right person to talk about it. Well, I have some news for you. The social science studies who is the most effective messenger on climate change. Number 10 is celebrities like Bill Nye, the science guy. Number nine, politicians. Number seven is religious leaders. Number six is military leaders. Number three is healthcare professionals. Number two is scientists. But guess who number one is? Number one is you. Friends and family, wow. people we know are the most effective messengers. So you are already the perfect person. How do you have that conversation? I have some resources for you. Ready? Here we go again. Just a second. Let me share my screen. Resource number one. I have a TED Talk that lays out a template of how do we have a conversation. We start with bonding over a value that we share, which is easy. Birds, right? It doesn't have to be right. birds. It could be... You know, it could be uh, another shared interest. It could be the places where you live. It could be the fact that you're a member of the Rotary Club or the Qantas Club. It could be that you're a parent. It could be that you're a member of a faith community. 
respond first, connect the dots between what we already care about and how a changing climate affects us. And then we have to talk about positive, creative, beneficial solutions to climate change that make the world a better place. And if you're looking for ideas in those solutions, Project Drawdown, which you can find online here, has amazing solutions. If you click on their solutions, they have dozens of solutions. Some of them might not surprise you. Some of them might very much surprise you. I also have a few other resources for you. I, there is a fantastic organization called Climate Outreach, and they have an actual handbook on how to have a conversation about a changing climate. Oh, it's going to make me open on Adobe. I'm not going to do that. But this lays out a fantastic template. It's called the Talking Climate Handbook. I also wrote an essay for a women's magazine. This Canadian women's magazine called Chatelaine, how to talk about climate change so people will listen. And our global weirding episodes, which you already mentioned, we have a global weirding episode about the pandemic and about how it's affecting our carbon emissions as well. But the second most popular episode we have is if I just explain the facts, surely they'll get it right. And this explains how it isn't about more scientific facts. It is about connecting the dots between what we already care about, how climate change is fix it and what we can do to fix it. So check out these resources and I guarantee you after you've reviewed these resources, you will feel equipped to have that conversation. Thank you for sharing those resources. That, those are such cool resources. Everyone, please check them out. Um, and echoing David, it's so great to have you on with us today, Catherine. So I like how you refer to climate change as not just an environmental issue, but also a threat multiplier. So could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that? Yes, I absolutely could. And what I'm doing is I'm going to put these resources right here in the chat box. So if you were thinking, well, Catherine, how do I find what you were just quoting? Don't worry, I'm putting the links right there in the chat box so you can get them yourselves. Okay. Yes, there they all are. And actually, we should put global weirding there too, probably. Let's put global weirding there as well. All right, so go ahead and, and click in the chat box if you want those resources. But the reason we care about climate change is not because it's increasing the average to the planet by one or two or three or even four degrees. It's because that warming is affecting every living thing on the planet. It isn't about saving the planet. The planet will still be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It is about us and is about the most vulnerable species on the planet, which of course includes many bird species as well. How is climate change affecting us? It's taking the challenges we already face today, challenges for us humans of poverty, lack of access to clean water, Water, basic health care, political instability, air pollution, health issues, social, um, socioeconomic inequality and injustice. It's taking the issues birds are already coping with. Habitat degradation and loss and fragmentation, um, the spread of diseases, uh, shortages of food or uh, places to live. It's taking all of those issues and it's exacerbating them, making them worse. So that's why I think the single best description of climate change is the one that comes from the U.S. military. That is climate change as a threat multiplier. That's a really great answer. Thank you for elaborating on that. So I have to ask, since we are a bird organization, what is your favorite bird? Uh, um, well, I am from Toronto, Canada, and our bird is the blue jay. Um, but I also grew up north, um, uh, north of Toronto in the, in the lake area, and our bird there is the loon. So I grew up going to sleep every night listening to the loon call across the lake. So if I had to pick two birds, those would be my two favorite birds. Great choices. That's great. Uh, and by the same token, something we've asked our other guests today, what does Earth Day mean to you? And how does your faith inform how you think about climate and caring for the Earth? Mm -hmm. We all care about climate change uh, because of who we already are. What already matters to us is what brings us to talking about climate change and acting on climate. And for me, the biggest part of who I am is my faith. I'm a Christian. And I believe that we have responsibility over every living thing on this planet to care for it, to ensure its welfare. That includes plants, it includes animals, it includes birds, and it includes our fellow sisters and brothers here and around the world. And when we look at a changing climate, those who have contributed the least to the problem both human and animal, are the ones that are being most affected by its impacts. And that just isn't fair. 
So to me, caring about climate change is a way to live out my faith. And I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times um, last October, I'll give you the link right here, so you can read it if you want to, where I connected the dots directly between what I believe as a Christian and why that actually makes us the perfect person to care. In fact, I believe that if people really took the Bible seriously, they would be out at the front of the line demanding climate action. And you might be surprised to learn that there actually are a lot of people who are I attended an online uh, service this morning led by the Evangelical Environmental Network for Earth Day. Young Evangelicals for Climate Action have 30,000 members across the country advocating for clean energy standards and habitat protection and many other things too. So there are people who are taking their faith seriously. Um, people who are Christian, people who are Buddhist, people who are Hindu, people who are Muslim, people who are Jewish, people across the world who are motivated by their faith to care for this incredible planet that we live on and to care for every living on it. Beautifully put. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a great segue into one of the questions we got from an audience member. And they say, how do you stay hopeful knowing that so many people deny climate change or think that it won't affect them? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that um, actually, I'm going to share my screen with you to show you one more thing. And I would say that how do you stay hopeful is probably the most common question. I have gotten anywhere, wherever I speak, across North America, Europe, or beyond, over the last two years. And in order to stay hopeful, we have to go out and look for hope. It is not going to find us. We have to look for good news, for people who are acting, for things that are happening. And when we do, though, we can be encouraged by this. Let me show you this. This is also from the Yale Program on Climate Communication. It's called the Six Americas of Global Warming. And what it shows us is that only 10% of us are actually dismissive. Now, granted, people who are dismissive are the loudest voices. They're your uncle who will never stop talking about climate change at any Thanksgiving dinner. They're the people who comment online after every article, the, who troll the climate scientists on social media. There are a lot of the people in Washington, D.C. as well. But they're only 10% of the population. Did you know that 57% of us are already either alarmed or concerned about climate change? And 16% are cautious, which means we lead with our doubts, but we're willing to listen and willing to be convinced. Only 27%, about a quarter of us, are truly not on board. And that means that having positive, constructive conversations with people who are cautious and people who are concerned and moving them into the alarmed category is one of the most important things we can do. I don't actually talk to dismissives. If somebody confronts me publicly or on social media, I'll answer them so people know we have an answer. But I'm not here to to change a dismissive's mind. I'm here for the 90% of the rest of us. That's where we truly can make a difference. I think that's a great way to think about it. So speaking of social media and people going online, you are quite active on Twitter. Um, so how do you think tools like social media platforms can assist with climate communications? Yes, I absolutely am on Twitter. You can see me right here. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and you can find me there as well. I try to actually post different and all those places. I'm not there though to reach people who aren't interested because if they're not interested we really have to begin our conversation with something that we have in common whether it's knitting or birding or food or our kids or the place where we live or skiing and that is best done offline. Online I'm there for people who are already interested who might be concerned who might be alarmed who even might just be cautious but curious to provide information that would help them no more that would make them feel equipped to have a conversation, information that they can share with people who they know. And uh, social media, I think, is a tool, right? You can use it for good or you can use it for evil. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do use it for evil, we know that, but I try my best to use it for good. And you certainly do that. We're so grateful for everything you do. We wanted to close our segment with you because we know your time is very precious with a comment from one of our viewers named Kim. Um, and Kim says, I have never heard someone speak to their faith as faith in their in the Bible as a reason to care about climate change. I love that. Thank you. That's from Kim. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for everything you do. You are truly making the world a better place. You're a hero and inspiration to many of us. And we appreciate your time tonight so very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Catherine. Happy Earth Day.
Well, uh, as we've mentioned throughout the show, today is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. The first one was celebrated in 1970. Um, so this uh, often causes each of us to engage in reflections of the past, right? Uh, because it's a big anniversary. Um, but I think that this is a forward-looking day as we think about the challenges that climate change is uh, posing for those who are most affected and the generation that is doing some of the best work when it comes to climate change is actually um, the generation that's going to inherit a lot of this, young people. Um, so today we've pulled together a few young environmentalists who work with Audubon to ask them about Earth Day both now and in the future. Um, so it's really exciting for me to introduce two people that I enjoy working with very much, um, Rosalind Rivas and Dominic Arenas, and they're going to join Christine here for some Q&A about what Earth Day means to each of you as young environmentalists and Audubon staff members. Thanks all for being with us. Thanks for having us here. So, <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Uh, so let me start with the question we're asking everyone today, which is what Earth Day means to you. And just to keep things neat and tidy, let's go Dominic, Christine, and Rosalind. What does Earth Day mean to you? Dominic, up first. All right. Uh, thanks, David, for the question. Um, I think my answer is going to be grounded in what um, Dr. Hayhoe said. And, you know, the answer is uh, we start with the, uh, who, who we already are. Um, so who am I? I'm a storyteller for Audubon, someone that's, you know, emboldened to go vote locally and nationally. Uh, I'm an Asian American, um, a novice birder. Um, and when you examine all of the roles and identities that, you know, we are, I am, you know, I'm asking myself, how am I, how are my actions in service of the, uh, to the planet? Um, am I being a good consumer and looking at, you know, the sustainab sustainability um, stories behind um, what's being uh, made and, and stuff like that. So I think that is what comes to mind for me when I think about what Earth Day means to me. Yeah, so what Earth Day means to me is kind of jumping off of what Brooke mentioned earlier, because my first memory of Earth Day was actually in elementary school. And it was basically the thing that got me to think actively about the environment, because I was like, seven or eight years old and I remember every year it would be a huge event in my school in Dallas, Texas where we would we would have Earth Day parades and we would plant wildflowers outside and watch birds and we even invited Trinity River Audubon Center to come at one point. So Earth Day to me it's the it was basically the catalyst to get me to become an environmentalist. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think of Earth Day as something that's just very unifying, like globally unifying. We, living on this planet is something we all share in common, and that's something we can all celebrate. And it just reminds me of, like many of us, and like Christine was saying, and Brooke, um, just how much I love being in nature. Um, like, I'm a city girl. I grew up in New York City, born and raised in the Bronx here. Um, but I always loved hiking and being outdoors and living right next to the Bronx Zoo and the Botanical Garden. So that's always been a big part of my life. Um, but, you know, this day also brings, like, its fair share of frustrations um, when we mem re remember the realities of the world, <laughs> like how we're losing so much habitat, natural habitat, and how minority, indigenous, and um, poor communities especially are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Um, so Earth Day really makes me appreciate my home, our home, um, and kind of like reignites my drive to fight for environmental issues and climate justice. That's all really beautifully said. And Rosalind, I think holding that duality in our minds and hearts on a day like today, where we think about how much hope and joy we have and also the concerns that we have um, is part of what a day like this means. And Christine, I love the story that Earth Day is actually what got you into where you are now, uh, all the way back in elementary school. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I know that you are all now in your 20s, you're in your first jobs, and some of you have referenced thinking about Earth Day uh, even as children. So I'm wondering if you have an answer, um, and maybe we'll put this one to Rosalind and first and then Dominic, how have you seen Earth Day change during your lifetime? Yeah, so 
I mean, this may just be a product of us getting older and then noticing the importance of things more as we get older, but I definitely feel as though acknowledging Earth Day has just gotten more and more significant with every passing year. Um, as Dr. Heho was saying earlier, um, not everyone takes climate change as seriously as we would like, but it feels as though climate change is reaching a point in our like, collective consciousness that we just can't ignore. Um, anymore. So uh, we all have to face this and change the way we run things if we can actually secure our future. Um, and it's an issue many, many more young people are fighting for and it can, will continue to advocate for. Um, and in terms of how I celebrated Earth Day, I always loved getting involved in tree plantings and park cleanups when I was younger, and I still do now. Um, and now as an adult, I definitely have more of a grasp on the environmental movement and what I can do and what, what I support, how I vote, you know. Thanks, Rosalind. Great. Thank you. For me, um, and, and in my lifetime, I know I've noticed, you know, a growing um, understanding, uh, a growing understanding of ramifications of our actions. Um, so, uh, to bring an antidote somewhere to Christine, you know, after my third grade field trip on Earth Day, uh, my mom started to do little actions around the house of, you know, composting, um, leaving the light on as 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 much as possible, or leaving it off as much as possible. Um, and I think throughout my lifetime, I've seen people taking it upon themselves to do, do good for this planet. And I was reminded that um, today, um, while, while I was live streaming, um, while working Twitch and seeing how across the world, people that are artists, people that are journalists like myself, and uh, people that work um, nationally and locally to affect change on a political level have, you know, responded to the needs of um, uh, the needs of the earth. So um, there's definitely been a growing and growing passion, and I was just, you know, today reminded again that 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 passion is not just something that's happening locally or on this show, but it's happening um, in multiple places across the world. Yeah, thank you for that. And so that's looking back. Now let's look forward. So this is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. What do you think in another 50 years, the 100th anniversary of Earth Day might look like? Or at least what do you hope it would look like? Let, Dominic, let's stay with you uh, and then go to the other two as well. Uh, first and foremost, I definitely feel or I, I would want, you know, the Earth to not be beyond repairable or not not beyond repairable. Um, and I've had the you know opportunity to be on the ground during um, lobby days where we've I've got to document some climate advocates and their work um, to uh, place um, clean energy laws in Washington to conserve uh, water um, in Arizona. So I guess my hope uh, 50 years uh, down the line is to you know see the the impact of what we've done locally and on a state level. And hopefully, you know, we continue um, on that progress of, you know, um, having 100% clean energy standard in Washington and um, having that spread out um, in, in multiple states and multiple regions of the country. So um, whether that be, you know, chapter chapters advocating or um, college students advocating, I'd, I'd love to see um, during the 100th anniversary that, you know, we can go arm in arm and, um, Show, show how impassioned we are for the environment. Yeah, and like Dominic, my hope is also that our planet obviously will not be it irreparable. So it really depends a lot on what we do as a collective human species right now in the next 50 years. So I feel like it could, it could go two polarizing ways. And my hope is that um, we'll be celebrating. And, celebrating all that we've accomplished in the past 50 years in 2017. Yeah, I totally agree with Dominic and Christine. I mean, hopefully by then we'll continue on this trajectory of the general public taking climate change seriously. Um, but I have faith in our generation and our, those younger than us. Um, this is an issue we care so strongly about and we'll continue fighting for it until we actually see real change. And I definitely can see like larger marches like on a global scale, scale <laughs> all over the world. And also more storytelling because I, it seems personal stories are how you can really reach people with um, when it comes to this topic, especially on how climate change is affecting us personally and, and it can be more effective in changing someone's mind or point of view. 
That's such a good point, Rosalind, and it echoes some of what we heard from Dr. Hayhoe, right? That it's not about putting a bunch of data in front of people, but it's about connecting over those things that you have in common, telling stories. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, I know that a lot of our audience is saying uh, in the comments that if this, if you are the future, then the future looks bright. Um, so I wanna, I wanna ask you one more question. And as I'm asking this to our panelists, I also want those who are watching us to think about your answer and post it in the comments because after our panelists answer, you will read some of your comments as well. So the question is to each of you, what gives you hope? And Christine, let's start with you. Yeah, so I'll go back to when I was a child, a younger child. Um, so ever since Earth Day, I started caring about the environment in my version of being an activist was starting an environmental club in middle school, or I would go to my local malls and post up these posters calling for action. But now, like in today's age, I'm seeing like this on such a bigger scale with people like, I mean, Greta Thunberg's the most well-known probably, but there's also other young climate activists like Isra Hersey and Helena Gualinga and so many others. And the, the scale of the movement is something I could never have imagined when I was a little middle schooler. So that kind of solidarity is what gives me hope. Yeah, I agree with that. Dominic, how about you? Um, so I, I guess I want to bring up what I, you know, I saw on Twitch today. One of the, um, a younger artist uh, performed a song called Honor Earth. And they, you know, said, I will be there when the work is done and what I leave, what I leave for my grandchildren. So I guess my hope is in, you know, the people that I've talked to um, in the Audubon Network and in, um, on college campuses um, across uh, the country in, you know, those discussions already being had. And um, in, in 50 years from now, when we celebrate um, in a, for the 100th year anniversary of Earth Day, I know that even the people um, after us, since, you know, Rosden, myself, and Christine, you know, work at Audubon, but, you know, our, our college um, chapter people, um, I, I've gotten the chance to see the work that they've done, gone birding with them, and they've been, um, they're well informed about the environment, and I've seen them in action, um, planting native plants and talking to them about how even in a time when we're all isolated from each other, they're continuing to prepare for the future and putting in those um, those seeds for um, a world where we can celebrate um, together again. Um, so yeah, that's where my hope lies. Yeah. That's terrific. Yeah, and like many of you, like I've also been lucky to, since I was little, to get an exposure to like conservation. Like I would go to the Bronx Zoo like every other weekend. I That's where my love of nature grew. Um, and I really, it gives me hope that we can have a lot of like child and education surrounding wildlife conservation um, for the future generations. And yeah, like Christine was saying, like just, there is just like such a great energy of, of like the youth today, like um, just um, going to the climate strike or just different marches. You can tell, you can feel that this is something that is so dear to our hearts and we're not going to stop of, like fighting for it and trying to make a change in this world. So yeah, I definitely like, my hope definitely lies in the work that we as a youth group are doing. Yes, and Dominic, you mentioned the Audubon on Campus College Chapters Program, and in less than a year and a half, that has exploded to almost 120 college and university campuses all over the country. Uh, it's just fantastic getting to know a lot of those students, some of whom are probably watching us tonight. Hello. Um, so, as I promised, we want to hear from our audience. So please keep the answers to the question, what gives you hope coming? Uh, to our panelists, we're going to put this in a time capsule so you can watch it on, on the 100th anniversary of Earth Day and see where we are. Um, but Christine, why don't we hear from some of our viewers? Yep. So I'll share my screen here. Uh, let me see, share. So Cass shared with us earlier on Twitter that, let me pull it up. So Cass says, new life thriving in the midst of suffering, that's my hope. So I think that's a really great way to find inspiration in this situation and it's a great way to appreciate birds. And let's see, let me stop sharing. 
And then let's see. Kawaii says, a pair of house finches made a nest and raised four little baby birds, and they just fledged, all caps, today, exclamation point. My husband and I got to watch them grow up right from our big front window. That's awesome. That's terrific. Uh, we've got one from Shira, who has a simple but beautiful answer. Birds give me hope. Thank you, Shira. I agree. Uh, and then one from Judy, too. Judy says, as someone in my 70s, what gives me hope is hearing from your amazing panelists. They are so impassioned. They make the future seem so bright. Here, here. Thank you all for that. Um, well, thank you, Rosalind and Dominic, so much for joining us. Uh, we're almost at the end of our show tonight, but we really appreciate you bringing hope to Judy and to so many of us um, from what you shared tonight, the work that you do every day. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Well, as we uh, close out our celebration tonight of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we wanted to come back to this notion of climate change um, and the way that, as uh, Dr. Hayhoe reminded us, it multiplies all the other threats that we face um, as individuals and as communities. Um, and that's true for birds as well. We know from Audubon's science that if we do nothing to stop the current pace of climate change, two thirds of North American bird species face extinction. It's very stark, very dire. Um, we also know as Dr. Hayhoe and Roslyn and others have shared tonight that climate change affects the most vulnerable among us. Um, low income communities, communities of color, uh, immigrants and refugees, both here in the United States and around the world. These people are the ones who bear the brunt of every disaster from this current pandemic to the long-term march of climate change. Um, so this is a moment where we recognize those threats, right, as we discussed. It's also a moment where we think about hope, where we think about more resilient communities. We think about more jobs, cleaner air, cleaner water, um, and healthy, thriving bird populations that bring us so much joy. Um, through habitat restoration and healthy ecosystems. Um, so the thing that we like to close our show by doing is saying, if you do one thing for birds this week. So if you do one thing for birds this week, uh, we want you to think about the fact that Congress uh, in, in Washington, D.C. is considering investments to bring our economy back after this global pandemic. One of the best things that Congress can do after some of this immediate work is done is to support programs that build more resilient communities with more jobs, cleaner air and water, um, and restore those natural spaces that sustain all of our well-being, whether we're birds or people. Um, so we're going to drop a link in the comments right now. And what we'd like you to do is send a message to your members of Congress. If you do one thing for birds this week, please write to your member of Congress or even better call them, and we'll drop that info in as well, um, and tell them that you want to build a better future for birds, for people, and for the places that we share together. So if you do one thing for birds this week, please, as Dr. Aho encouraged us, raise your voice, speak out to Congress using the link in the comments, uh, and speak out to those in your lives that you treasure and value. Well said, thank you, David. So thank you everyone for joining today. And for all of you who are watching, we're loving seeing all the birds you're sharing from your home with the hashtag I saw a bird. So keep those coming and be sure to stay tuned for next week, Wednesday, 7 p.m. for our fourth episode. And happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day.